Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's good to see you this afternoon. Just before we start, I just want us to sing that song. Worthy is the Lamb as we prepare our minds to the message this afternoon. It will be led by Darren and Richard. I will turn off my mic. Good to be here with you today. 
was absent last week. The week before that, I think I was here. But it's good to be here. Good to see all of you. Welcome. We have visitors. I um, want to say welcome to Sorry, welcome to some visitors from Princess Town. I got that right. We have some visitors from Princess Town. Uh, also, so we have a daughter of Takarigua, Sister Alvita Scabro. She's here with us today, and her lovely, her lovely baby, Pastor Davin, is here as well, but he's in Utka uh, with a march, and he'll be visiting us. Uh, very, very soon as well. So welcome to all the visitors. Welcome to the members. Uh, welcome to those who want to be members of Takarigua. Welcome, ju welcome Justin. It's good to have you. Uh, Justin is always here. Um, thank you so much. Uh, well then, you're learning. Good job. All right. This message... Today, I want to start by just giving you a little context for the message. I'm in a, a chat, a WhatsApp group. Um, in that group, you have some persons discussing Bible and, you know, theology and different things, Bible-related. Don and Kerry, are you comfortable there? You guys want to go sit in the audience until we're done? Just see in the back of Don's head and... <laughs> all right. And, and, you know, they have discussions all the time. And Thank you. Thank you very much. You're getting better, boy. This is better because Darren brought me cold water. <laughs> oh, that, oh, that's my wife. Thank you, dear. <laughs> all right. So, I know with these discussions, we all have some challenges. And recently, something came up in the chat, a particular topic, and it went on and on. It started to get very heated. And uh, someone says, well, this is my position. I don't care what you all think. Who vex loss? That's the truth. I didn't say it, right? Who vex loss? And then some people took offense to that because we're talking about the Bible. And they started to deal with that. And I started to think, you know, this group is a group that is supposed to be presenting Christ and the Word. And we are now at the point where people are more concerned with sharing their opinion or, or, or really sharing what they think and trying to ensure that their positions are ultimately correct and and, and, and they're trying to present what is supposed to be biblical truth in a way that contradicts the Bible. You ever seen people get in a fight over Bible? You start discussing the Bible, you start with prayer, you start discussing the Bible, and before you know, people vex. It now is about us and not about Christ. It is no longer about us being brothers and sisters in the chat, but it is about us being right and everybody else being wrong. It is an effort for us to show that our knowledge and our spirituality is somehow superior. And we're forgotten then the fundamental, the fundamental truth of loving each other and the fundamental truth of Paul asking us to lift each other up above ourselves. It's not all about us. And then I was following this discussion on banning conversion therapy for LGBTQ+, etc., talking about banning this therapy and anything that could help persons who are going through the challenge 
going through this identity, sexual identity crisis, who really wants to be that person, wants to be who God has created them to be. There's an attempt now to ban that. And uh, so these former LGBT, LGBTQ plus members, former who are now Christians, they came and they're speaking about the transformation that they received and that they have gone through once they accepted Christ. Thoughts and both say amen. And of course then, you know, they would have gotten help from pastors and counselors, gone through therapy and stuff. And, and they're sharing the testimonies and some are sharing the testimonies, uh, some previously would have been gay and trans, transgender and who would have had thousands of partners and who would have really hit rock bottom and even tried suicide, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they're speaking and now saying that they have experienced God's mercy and His grace and His forgiveness. And they're saying that they, the, the church that they attended, attended sorry, embraced them and loved them through their transformation and the church celebrated the restoration. And they're speaking about these things. They go to the church and there's no discussion about theology and doctrine and Daniel and Revelation at this point. At this point, they need Jesus Christ. What they need is to understand that God is able to save and to transform and to restore them through the blood of Jesus Christ and through a caring church family. Do we really understand that Jesus is who we really need? Do we understand that we need to really follow him so that we can be transformed from self into his image? The message I am preparing today, you know, I've heard pastors say, I, I really didn't want to preach this message. But God laid this message on my heart. I really didn't want to talk about this, but, but, the, but God laid it on my heart. And this message is a message I've been thinking about for a long time. A message that I really did not want to speak on. And that's the truth. I avoided this. I tried my best to get away from it. Elder Walt, I thought about many different things. Things that would be nice and easy for a Sunday, for a Saturday evening, sorry. When I said easy, I thought easy like Sunday morning, sorry. <laughs> and it kept, it kept coming back. It kept coming back. Because it spoke to me. And I pray that it will speak to you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, God, for your goodness and for your love. Thank you, Lord, for that blood, that blood that never loses its power. And we can come to you anytime with any situation. And Father, you're more than able to cleanse, to restore. I ask God even now that you would speak through me, that you would cleanse me. I would be totally submitted to you. And as your message goes forward, I pray that we would be transformed in Jesus' name. Ananias hurries through the narrow Damascus streets. Beads of sweat falling from his brow. His face is serious. And his mind is distant from his location. He, <clears throat> he doesn't acknowledge the greetings from his friends. He doesn't hear them calling him out and saying, good morning, An 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 Ananias. Deep in his thoughts and engaged in a conversation with himself. Saul? 
so? Nah. Something is wrong here. He wonders if he got the instructions wrong. He, he begins to think that he should probably tell someone where he's going. But he knows if he tells someone where he's going, his friends would probably say that he is stupid. And if he tells his wife, she would beg him not to go. But he has to go. He scampers through the marketplace. He pushes through the crowds of merchants and shoppers. He's dodging camels and pushing past donkeys. He, he continues on until he reaches the street called the Straight. He reaches the inn and he begins to reconsider what he is called to do next. As he thinks about who he is about to encounter, Ananias and the other disciples, they have been preparing for him. Some Christians have left the city. Some have gone into hiding. Saul's reputation of being a Christian killer preceded him. Ananias pauses and, and he reflects on the message one more time. Arise. And go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for the one called Saul of Tarshish. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive sight. Ananias gets the message, but he thinks that God may have forgotten some details. God, I, I think that you may have gotten the names mixed up a bit. You may need to turn off autocorrect on your device. Because I have heard from many about this man. I have heard how much he, he, he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. I have heard that he has been given authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But there is no mistake. God is serious about this. Go, for he is a chosen vessel, a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. A chosen vessel? Yes, he was a chosen vessel of the Pharisees to destroy the Christians. And now you're saying he is your chosen vessel? Saul, the chosen vessel. There's, there's not even a ring to it. And he's in deep thought and he's thinking maybe I should just go back home. But one of the guards sees him. What do you want? Why are you here? I have, been to, I have been sent to help the rabbi. Well, we hope you can. Something has happened to him. He hasn't eaten. He hasn't had anything to drink. He hasn't been sleeping. We hope you can help. And they let down the spears and they allow him to enter. And Ananias can't turn back now. He follows the narrow stairway to the best room in the inn, the finest decor, decor, the freshest scents, and eventually he reaches the door of Saul's room. It is opened, but it's dark. There's a, a, a stench. It smells like stale food. He walks into the room, just stepping in far enough, and he looks at the bed, and there is no Saul. He looks at the table laden with fruit, now beginning to rot, no soul. And then in the corner of his eyes, he, he catches some movement in a dark corner. He is shocked by what he sees. The great persecutor Saul, the one who brought fear just at the mention of his name, he sits 
in a dark corner, his legs crossed, his lips dry and cracked, his cheeks sinking into his face. He stares into nothing and he rocks back and forth, saying what appears to be a prayer. How long has he been like this? Three days. Ananias hesitates a bit. And he steps further into the room. He, he now stands in the same space as Saul. Saul, who saw Christians as, a, as, a, as, as carriers of a plague. Saul, who stood at Stephen's trial and, and was the guy holding the coats for those who were executing Stephen. He nodded and he smiled as Stephen drew his last breath. And when the Sanhedrin needed a hitman to terrorize the church, Saul said, here am I, send me. He persecuted the church beyond measure. And he tried his best to destroy it. Ananias knew what Saul had done to the church in Jerusalem. He knew what... Ananias did to the people, he knew what he, sorry, he knew what Saul did to the people. He knew how he persecuted the people, how he killed, how he tried to destroy the church. But now, now he is about to learn what God had done to Saul. Ananias walks into the room. He sits on the floor next to Saul. Saul continues to stare in the direction of a window, but there is no blinking. There is a film-like crust covering his eyes. He just stares and rocks and prays. And Ananias takes the hand of the once terrorist, feels him trembling. Ananias realizes now that Christ had already done the work. Brother Saul, how sweet those words must have sounded to Saul. How much comfort he must have felt in those words. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, he has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Tears begin to rush down Paul, Saul's face. He accepts this new title of brother, this new encounter with Christ and, and, and the transformation. He accepts this transformation as he is filled with the Spirit. The scales fall from his eyes. He has received spiritual insight and now his physical sight is also restored. He blinks a few times. He, he, he slowly, his eyes slowly adjusting to the lights. As the darkness is removed and he sees the face of his new friend. He sees the face of one of the many that he was sent to destroy. But now this is no longer an enemy, but a friend. This is no longer a stranger, but a brother. And within quick time, Saul is baptized. Within a few days, he is preaching Jesus in the synagogue. Saul becomes the Apostle Paul and ushers in the gospel across the civilized world and turns the world right side up for Jesus. God used Paul to touch the world, but he first used Ananias to touch Saul. The question today is who is your Saul? Who is your Saul? Who is that person that you question? Who is that person that you've written off? Who is that person you, you think he's gone too far? You think he is too difficult? You, you think she has done the unforgivable? You think she is too cold or he is too old to change? You think that the wounds got too deep to give that person a second thought? Far less a second chance. Who has brought you to the point where you believe 
that there is nothing good in that person. Where you have told yourself that that person is beyond redemption and you will never seek after that person again. But my question to you is who gives you the right? Who gives you the right? Who has authorized you to decide that that, that, that person is not worth your time? Not worth your energies, not worth your forgiveness. Who, who has given you the power to declare that this person is not enough, not good enough <clears throat> to have your mercy extended to them? Have you started the journey and, and gotten at the, uh, to the top of your street name straight and decided to turn back? Because your soul did too much to you, too much to your family. And you are not, you are not even going to give them a conversation, let alone call them brother or sister. Have you gotten to the church on the street called Sing? Entered into that church and bobbed and weaved so that you don't have to pass that person? I've done it. And I, I, I went to that person and I spoke to the person. And the person shared their thoughts and I shared my thoughts and we were good. Have you entered through those doors, deciding that that person wasn't worth your time, but you came to church to worship God? I want to say to you that you are not worshiping God. You are not worshiping God. You're worshiping self, pride, the enemy of our souls. The one who comes into the church to kill, to steal, to destroy. You think he's only doing it in your home? He does it in the church. And he's using us, using us as a great weapon to bring division in the church of God. We are here today having washed somebody's feet about to take the bread and wine and, and we have not made it right with a brother or sister. I want to say to us that we are eating unworthily. If we are harboring ill feelings and holding grudges and unforgiveness, if we have not sought to make it right, we could as well ask Sister Kizzy to bring some ice for the wine and some peanut butter for the bread because we would just be having a meal. I am tired of getting calls about challenges within the membership, and broken relationships in the church. And when I say, hey, you know, I understand, but let's have a conversation. Let's have a, a meeting. Let's try to clear this up. Let's, let's bring some healing. And, 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 and the person calling and speaking about the problem and the issue that they may have had with another member, their response is, no, 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 pastor. I don't want to meet with that person. I don't plan on talking to that person again. 
So why are you calling? I am uh, tired of coming to church and dealing with behaviors and hearing from people that is who they are. And he or she has been like this for the longest time. What is going on with us if we are not being transformed by the word through the spirit? What is going on with us if we are here coming every week, teaching, preaching, singing, discussing, doing all those things, but the basic fundamentals of Christianity we are missing? Forgiveness, mercy, grace, restoration. What's going on with us? No one here today has the right to deny the other forgiveness. We are too focused on uh, being right, and we forget that God has not called us to be right, but to be righteous and to be holy, even as he is holy, and to reflect his character of agape love, unconditional love. Jesus on the cross, he forgave those who crucified him, he forgave those who sold him out. He forgave those who betrayed him. He forgives you and he forgives me every day. But we decide to hold on the story and hold on to the challenge and hold on to the circumstance and distance ourselves from our souls because we think that we are more righteous. Because we think that we have reached a spiritual plane and because we think they are not worthy of restoration. God tells us that all our righteousness is like filthy rags. All of us who think that we are righteous and think that we are uh, right, if we are not being transformed and living out his righteousness, it means absolutely nothing. I am imperfect. Today, I had to pray for forgiveness and ask for God's mercy and his grace to cover me. Who am I then to expect that God, for God to hear me? Who am I to expect that God will honor my petition and he would forgive me? And he would give me another chance. Who am I to expect that but not extend it to my soul? How do I decide to come week after week and month after month and year after year? How am I coming to church? How am I going to work? How am I going home and not speaking with my soul? Not forgiving my soul? How do I expect that my, how do I expect my prayers to go higher than the roof of this church? It is inevitable that we're going to have challenges in all our relationships, in your marriage, in your family, in church, as a pastor and the members. I have had challenges. I have upset some people. Some people have upset me, praise the Lord. But as long as I know, I try to reach out to that person. I try to make amends. Because I am the kind of guy, it really bothers me when I try to sleep. I think about it. I want to know that I could stand here when I speak. I know that I've tried my best to make it right with anyone in here who I may have offended. And I may not always get it right. I had a situation with a member. And we spoke about it. The person shared their thoughts. I shared mine. And I was good. 
I moved past it. And a couple of weeks after I came to church, I hadn't been around for a bit, I came to church and I said, I hugged the person. The person said, hey, pastor. You good? I said, yeah. So what happened? I thought you were vexed with me. I was like, but why would I be vexed? I thought you were still vexed about what happened a couple of weeks back. I said, no, we talked about it, and I moved on. It seems as though we have been conditioned to, 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 to be okay with people being upset. Are we okay, we are, we are okay with having division in the church? It seems as though we, we have grown okay with having a, a grudge or having a challenge and worshiping in the same church. It seems as though we are okay to continuously avoid and then come up here and offer prayer on the church's behalf. And then sing together we are marching to Zion. There's a place in Trinidad called Zion, right? No? Right, so I think we're marching to Tobago. As persons come into this church, we're wrapping up. Are they experiencing the love of God? Are they seeing the difference that they are supposed to see? Is the transformation obvious by the way we love and treat each other? And as I do every communion, I want to encourage you today, before you eat the bread, before you drink the wine, settle in your heart with the spirit that you will reach out to your soul. Settle in your mind that you will no longer allow pride to get in the way of doing what God has asked you to do. Settle in your mind that you will not let another day go by without making it right with your soul. Tomorrow is not ours. As I was reviewing this, I thought about this, the young man who was shot in the home invasion, sitting home with his family, his parents, Hearing someone trying to break in, trying to defend your property and uh, protect your parents and to lose your life. Tomorrow is not ours. Your life is not in your hands. I encourage you that as you eat today and as you drink, make it right with God. Walk all the way down your street Call straight and embrace your soul as brother and embrace your soul as sister. May God bless you.